Good evening, Cleveland and Darlington. It's not rocket science. And yes, the subtitle is, well, that's what I'm talking about, rocket science. But rocket science is considered to be ridiculously hard, but mainly just because the maths gets in the way. So let's see how far we can get without any maths. Excuse me. OK. What do you do? Why? Well, I don't mean to boast, but uh, I'm a brain surgeon. Brain surgery? <laughs> Exactly rocket so that's what I'm talking about. Rocket science, not rocket technology. I'm not talking about how you build yourself a Saturn V in your back garden. I'm not talking about how rockets work as such. It's about basically orbits and how we get around the solar system. So I'll be thinking about what a rocket actually does, thinking about orbits, and how we get from A to B. For instance, how we get from Earth to Mars and how we get to other planets for exploration. And I'll be finishing with a look at these mysterious Lagrange points. How is it that we can park a spacecraft like the James Webb Space Telescope at a particular point in space? So firstly, what does a rocket do? If you ask a lot of people, what is the primary function of a rocket? A lot of people will say, well, it's to lift things above the atmosphere. Well, yeah, sort of, but not really. The main thrust of a rocket is to get things to go sideways. The space station and the Hubble Space Telescope, for instance, are actually still in the Earth's atmosphere. Yes, they're a few hundred kilometers up, but they're still inside a rather thin atmosphere. To put an object into Earth orbit, which is one of the prime functions of a rocket launching from Earth, what you really need is not necessarily height. What you really need is horizontal speed. Yes, getting as high as possible is considered a good thing because you can reduce atmospheric drag. It's not strictly necessary, but it's a good idea. But what's absolutely essential if you want to go into orbit is horizontal speed. Now, for more than 300 years, we've known this. Newton had this thought experiment. Rather than talking about rockets, he said, what if you put a cannon on a very high mountain? What matters is how fast the cannonball goes horizontally in terms of whether it, will it drop back to the horizon? Will it drop back to Earth? Or will it end up in an orbit as indicated by the dashed line C or D? So the need for horizontal velocity has been known for more than three centuries. Yes, when rockets take off, they take off vertically. But it isn't too long before the rocket starts to tilt over. This is not an accident of perspective. It is genuinely trying to get as much sideways horizontal velocity as possible. So yes, it needs to reach a particular altitude, but what's important is it goes sideways fast enough to put the objects it's carrying, the payload, into orbit. If you don't have the horizontal velocity, basically you go up and then you come back down again. So for instance, Blue Origin, New Shepard, it went vertically up, gained an altitude of about 100 kilometers so that you can claim the people on board went into space. But as soon as you cut the engine, it comes straight back down again and lands not too far away from where it took off. New Shepard flight time of about 10 minutes or so. So without that horizontal velocity, all you do is go up and down. If you want to go into orbit, you have to go sideways. So let's think about orbits. Now, an orbit is simply the path of an object that's affected only by gravity. Strictly speaking, if a rocket motor is pushing the object, then it's not actually following an orbit. An orbit is the path of an object when it's not being pushed around by anything else other than gravity. So we're all used to the idea of planets in orbit around the sun, or perhaps moons in orbit around their parent planets. 
we tend to think of orbits as only being these circular or elliptical paths that the planets or moons take. Strictly speaking, an orbit does not have to be a closed loop, but we'll deal with that a little later. So Kepler observed that the planets orbit in ellipses, and Newton figured out why, his law of universal gravitation. Newton figured out that if the Sun is pulling on all these planets with a force that depends on the inverse of the distance squared, then the objects will travel in ellipses. And the circle is just a, an example of a particular type of ellipse. In the introduction, I said Kepler, Newton and Buzz Aldrin, because Kepler worked out what the orbits are, Newton figured out why they were that shape, and Buzz Aldrin seems to have an innate ability to mentally work out how you get from one orbit to another. His ability to calculate these things in his head was truly amazing. So Newton figured out that orbits have the shape of so-called conic sections. If you take a cone and slice through the cone at various angles, you get these possible shapes. Circle, ellipse, parabola, hyperbole. And if we think about these shapes here, indicating how objects might move around the sun, the curves that describe orbits around the sun, or indeed around a, a parent planet, these are also the same curves that define the shapes that we would get for mirrors if we wanted to focus light. We can use circular or elliptical or parabolic or hyperbolic mirrors to focus light. And the reason that the curves are the same for orbits as they are for mirrors focusing light is essentially because the maths is, the underlying maths is the same for both. So we know that planets follow closed elliptical orbits. So orbits such as the two black lines indicated here, remember circle is just a particular type of ellipse. If an object is falling in from the Oort cloud, from a great distance, it follows something very close to a parabolic arc, this particular line indicated here, the parabola. And we also know that if an object doesn't simply fall in from a great distance, but actually arrives in the solar system already travelling with some speed, then it will follow one of these black lines beyond the parabola, one of these so-called hyperbolic orbits. Now, an example of that is this particular object called Om This rock came into the solar system in 2017 and it followed the, the white line over a period of months where it was tracked. So not only can we actually see the shape of the orbit by following the track, we can also measure its velocity, especially its velocity here at perihelion, the closest point to the Sun, and it was found that it was travelling at a speed here which was greater than the escape velocity for the solar system. In other words, it's going to be escaping the solar system no matter the fact that the Sun is going to be pulling it back for the rest of its journey. It's going fast enough that it will escape the solar system. And so we can conclude that it must have been travelling at some speed when it came into the solar system also. Now if we think about orbits in terms of their size and the orbital period, how long it takes to go once around the Sun, here's a hypothetical situation of two planets, a green planet and a red planet. The green one is closer to the Sun, so the gravitational pull from the Sun is stronger, and hence the planet moves faster to stay in orbit so the year is relatively short. By comparison, the red planet is further from the Sun, the gravitational pull is weaker because of the distance, and so the red planet moves more slowly. It's actually travelling more slowly, and it's got a longer orbit to cover, if I run that simulation again. So for both those reasons, the period, the length of time it takes to orbit the Sun, is longer. So this is the key point I want to make. If you've got a strong gravitational pull, you move faster than if there's a weak gravitational pull on any body in the solar system. We can see that if we think of satellites around the Earth. The ones very close to the Earth are going around quite quickly in only 90 minutes or so, like the Hubble Space Telescope and the ISS. GPS satellites are much further out and they take about 12 hours to go around the Earth and geostationary satellites out here are taking 24 hours to go around the Earth, by definition for a geostationary orbit. So it's exactly the same for, for objects moving around for the Earth as it is for planets moving around the Sun. 
Now Newton figured out exactly what maths we need to use for understanding how one object orbits another, whether it be the Earth orbiting the Sun, or the Moon orbiting the Earth, or any planet orbiting any star in principle. Describing the relative motion of two objects is straightforward and easily soluble. But when it comes to three objects, well, we have a problem. It may be surprising to learn that two is soluble, but three is impossible. There is no easy analytic solution. There's no easy way of writing down the formula if we're dealing with three objects. For instance, the moon going round the Earth and the Earth going round the Sun. Or the moon and Venus both going round the Sun, taking all of the gravitational pulls into account. We can run simulations of what's happening with a three-body problem, and in this particular example, what starts off looking very neat, just three elliptical orbits of three objects moving around their centre of gravity, once the simulation runs a little bit longer, we realise, well, no, it's not quite so simple. It's starting to look very chaotic. And that's often the case. It's very difficult to find a situation where we get a nice, neat, symmetrical, soluble problem, soluble with simple formulae, whenever we have more than two objects. We have to resort to numerical simulations. We have to resort to computers working out the gravitational pull between each of the objects, one object being pulled by the other two, and running simulations such as this one to see how things behave. So if we did want to get from the Earth to another object in the solar system, how do we do that? Let's take a couple of examples. Let's think about going from Earth to Mars. So here's a, a little animation from back in 2018 when we tried to get a lander, sorry, a, a probe from the Earth to Mars. You might assume that to go from Earth to Mars, the most sensible thing to do is to wait until Earth and Mars as, are as close as possible and then go hell for leather over the shortest possible distance. But that's not the most fuel efficient way of getting from Earth to Mars. The actual route taken starts from Earth when it's at one point in its orbit, and the spacecraft doesn't get to Mars until it's travelled to the other side of the solar system, basically on the opposite side of the Sun. Notice that as we approach Mars, Mars is catching us up. We're in the spacecraft, the little purple spacecraft, and if we run that animation again, as we travel towards Mars, it looks like we're travelling at roughly the same speed of Mars. But as we get closer, it's clear that we're slightly ahead of Mars, and Mars is catching us up, which means we are travelling more slowly than Mars once we arrive at this point in the orbit. And that's quite important when it comes to working out how we're going to use a rocket to change our speed, change our velocity, to get us to leave Earth and get us to arrive at Mars. So let's have a look at that orbital mechanics. This is too complicated, let's just dim that out and leave the essential bits, which is an orbit of Earth and an orbit of Mars. We're going to assume that Earth and Mars are both in circular orbits because that's simply easier. They're actually ellipses and they are slightly offset from each other. That makes it far too complicated. Let's just assume they are circular orbits and this diagram is not to scale. If we want to leave Earth and arrive at Mars, the simplest fuel efficient way of doing it is to leave Earth and arrive at Mars when they are opposite each other in the solar system, as indicated here. So we would actually follow a particular orbit from Earth to Mars that looks like the blue ellipse. To make that a little clearer, let me just temporarily take Earth and Mars away, their orbits. There's the trajectory that we would like to follow from Earth to Mars. It's an elliptical orbit where the closest approach from the Sun touches the Earth orbit, and the most distant point from the Sun just touches the Mars orbit. This is the so-called Hohmann transfer. You might have heard that name if you're a fan of films like The Martian, where they talk about the Hohmann transfer to get from, Mar from Earth to Mars. So Earth is going at a particular speed around the Sun, but if we want to change from following the Earth around the Sun to changing onto the blue Hohmann transfer, then we need to give the spacecraft a little extra velocity. We need to give it a kick. Basically, a rocket needs to fire to increase the speed of the spacecraft 
and by increasing the speed we're talking about changing its delta v. Spacecraft engineers are always talking about delta v, changing the speed of, an air, uh, of a spacecraft to get it from one orbit to another. So to get away from the Earth we need a kick, which is usually done with a rocket engine, to get out of Earth's orbit and put it onto the blue orbit. Remember what we just said in the last animation, once we actually arrive at Mars some time later, we are travelling more slowly than Mars. Mars is catching up with us, and if we don't do anything we simply continue on the blue orbit and come back to Earth orbit again. So if we want to travel at the same speed of Mars, once we reach Mars orbit we need a second kick. We need to fire the rocket engine again to accelerate us up to the speed of Mars at that point. And then we can go along at the same speed of Mars and, if we wish, go into Mars orbit or into what orbit of one of the moons or whatever it is we want to do. It might sound like a good idea to give a kick here and then when we arrive at Mars, if we want to land, we would need another kick to match our speed to Mars. Because it looks like if we decide not to land on Mars, what if we have to abandon the mission? All we have to do, it looks like, is to avoid firing the rocket a second time to catch up with Mars, and then we will fall back on the blue curve and end up back at Earth orbit. Well, that is indeed the case. But given that it takes about a year for Earth to go round the Sun, and about two years for Mars to go round the Sun, it's no surprise to learn that the length of time it takes to coast along the blue curve, the home and transfer, it's somewhere in between, about a little less than one and a half years. Which means if you leave Earth intending to land on Mars, and then change your mind and come back on the blue line, you end up back at Earth orbit one and a half years later. Which means the Earth, of course, has travelled once around the Sun, and then halfway round the Sun, so the Earth will be somewhere around here. So the Hohmann transfer brings you back to Earth orbit, but the Earth isn't there anymore. So the Hohmann transfer is great for minimising fuel, but you still have to worry about the timing. You have to leave Earth at just the right time to make sure that Mars is in the right place when you arrive and you can't immediately come back. You can't come back within a day or two or three, because when you follow the Hohmann transfer back to Earth orbit, Earth is in the wrong place. Transfers between Earth and Mars, and the home journey between Mars and Earth, can only be done at certain times when Mars and Earth are in the right place. And that makes going to Mars and returning from Mars much more tricky than simply going to the Moon and back, for instance. What about getting to other planets in the solar system? The Hohmann transfer is a nice, energy-efficient way of getting to Mars. You just have a burn when you leave the Earth and then you coast all the way to Mars and you have a little rocket burn at the other end. In the 1960s it was realised that if you want to go beyond Mars, for instance to the outer planets, then it's possible to slingshot to, at higher velocities towards the outer solar system. You can actually explore the outer solar system faster and cheaper by borrowing some of the momentum, some of the energy, of the planets themselves. If you fly by a big planet, especially Jupiter being a very massive planet, you can effectively rob it of some of its momentum and gain speed, which allows you to get to the outer solar system faster. And because you're using the energy of Jupiter, you're not using your rockets. You're not using fuel. Which means for a given amount of payload, you can have more instruments, more cameras, more spectrometers, and less fuel on board. So it makes for a much more efficient mission if you want to explore the outer solar system. And it was realised in the 1960s that if you look at where the planets are, the planets were nicely lined up for a slingshot from multiple planets. And that's why these missions to the outer solar system were planned in the 60s and launched in the 70s. But how does a slingshot actually work? If you think about an object like a, a ball rolling down a hill into a valley, as it rolls down the hill, it loses gravitational energy and hence picks up kinetic energy. It starts moving faster. 
So it accelerates down the hill and has a maximum speed, a maximum velocity, when it's in the bottom of the valley. And of course it doesn't stop there, let's ignore friction, let's ignore air resistance. Once it's got to the bottom of the valley it's got a certain speed and so it will start climbing up the other side of the valley. And if we imagine there's a, another hill of the same height on the other side, we will end up at the same height that we started. Not only do we get back to the same point, assuming no energy losses, it's also a result of the maths that if you think of any particular height, it doesn't matter where we choose, if you think of the speed of the object on the way in and the speed of the object on the way out, at the same height they will have the same speed. In other words, whatever speed you gain by coming down the hill, you will lose exactly the same amount by coming up to the same point. So if you have two hills of exactly the same height, you'll end up, if you start from rest here, you'll end up at rest there. So if that's the case, if going downhill you gain speed, but you will just lose exactly the same amount of speed by going up the hill on the other side, why is it that the slingshot by falling into Jupiter's gravity well and then coming out the other side, why isn't the same true? Why don't you lose all the energy you gained on the way in? Let's think about that situation. Let's imagine we're doing a flyby of Jupiter. So we're getting closer and closer to Jupiter. The maximum flyby speed will be when we're at our closest to Jupiter. So we've got an inward speed. Let's imagine we measure the speed, I don't know, a million miles away from Jupiter. There's a particular speed on our way in. It'll accelerate as it passes Jupiter. And then when it's a million miles away on the other side of Jupiter, its outward speed would presumably be the same. So we don't appear to have gained anything. Here's the clever bit. The inward speed and the outward speed at a given distance from Jupiter are indeed the same as measured by Jupiter. If you were standing somewhere close to the surface of Jupiter, you would see an object coming in at a particular speed and you would see that object leave at the same speed. But Jupiter itself is moving. Jupiter is going around the Sun. So if you arrange it so that the inward speed is coming in, as it were, broadside to the motion of Jupiter, and you arrange it so that when you leave Jupiter, you're traveling in the same direction as Jupiter, these two speeds are the same relative to Jupiter, but because we're using Jupiter's speed around the Sun, we can actually leave Jupiter with a speed around the Sun which is considerably higher than the speed at which we arrive. For instance, you might be coming in at 10 kilometers a second relative to the Sun, but the speed relative to the Sun when you leave, because your outward speed is added to Jupiter's speed, you might leave at something more like 25 kilometers per second. A substantial increase in speed, and remember this does not require any fuel. You do not need to fire your rockets, you just have to make sure that you arrive at Jupiter coming from the right angle and you miss Jupiter by the right amount to give you an outward direction which is in roughly the same direction as Jupiter orbiting the Sun. And that's the mechanics, as it were, of how you get a gravity assist. So this was tested in 1972 by Pioneer 10, which was launched from Earth and went to take pictures of Jupiter. And because it went close to Jupiter, it changed its direction quite substantially. You can see the purple line not only changes direction, if you actually notice the speed at which the purple dot is moving, or look at the numbers in the bottom left of the screen which tell you the velocity, you notice that it's falling as the object goes towards Jupiter, but as soon as it goes past Jupiter, the speed suddenly takes a jump and heads off in a different direction because of the gravity assist that Jupiter gave it. And hence Pioneer 10 is now leaving the solar system because it's now going substantially faster than it was originally. The same idea was tested in Pioneer 11. This time it left the Earth went to Jupiter to take pictures of Jupiter and used a gravity assist from Jupiter. Notice the extreme change in direction of the purple line as we go past Jupiter. The spacecraft is now thrown to the other side of the solar system for an encounter with Saturn. 
and again it passed Saturn fairly close and it got another gravity assist. Didn't really need one but it got a gravity assist and so Pioneer 11 is also leaving the solar system because of its speed. The little white ticks that you can see by the way on the purple line are just indicating that the purple line is not in the plane of the ecliptic. It's at a, a, a height above or below the ecliptic in this sort of uh, isometric view here. So testing these ideas out with Pioneer allowed the Voyager spacecraft to follow in their footsteps. Voyager 1, the mission was to get really nice close-up pictures of Jupiter and some of its moons, and one of its prime mission objectives was to get close to Titan because it was realized that Titan has an atmosphere and it's worth close inspection. So Voyager 1 was sent to get images of Jupiter, a gravity assist from Jupiter, there's the dog leg as it gets the gravity assist, and off it heads to Saturn. And it's trying to get as close as possible to Titan. So it doesn't worry about where it is with respect to Saturn, it doesn't try to get a gravity assist from Saturn, it simply tries to get as close as possible to Titan to get as close as possible to get images of the surface of Titan. That was its mission and it was successful. Voyager 2 was a few months behind it, but because Voyager 1 mission was successful, Voyager 2 didn't have any need to try and get close to Titan, and that meant Voyager 2 had the luxury of having a gravity assist from Jupiter and Saturn without worrying about where Titan was, and that allowed it to get a gravity assist to the outer solar system. First Jupiter, then Saturn, and the gravity assist from Saturn sent it to Uranus and then to Neptune. Notice that it doesn't seem to get a gravity assist from Neptune, but notice the white ticks, indicating that this particular probe went over the north pole of Neptune. It didn't attempt to go round the side to get a gravity assist, it went over the North Pole of Neptune to try and get as close as possible to the moon Triton, which was one of the reasons for visiting Neptune, to get a view of that particular rather interesting moon. If we have a look at the speeds, the speeds have been in the bottom left of these animations, but if we actually plot them out, it's instructive to see how the speed has changed as a function of distance from the Sun in astronomical units. 1 AU being the distance from the Earth to the Sun. So here's the speed in kilometres per second. Starting with the speed of the Earth around the Sun, you can see it very quickly drops, but then gets a kick from Jupiter, a kick from Saturn, a kick from Uranus, and a kick from Neptune. Notice that the kick from Neptune does accelerate it as it passes Neptune, but then when it comes away from Neptune, it's actually travelling more slowly than when it arrived. Unlike all of these gravity assists up to that point, once it's past Neptune, because the priority was go to the right place to see Triton, don't worry about getting a gravity assist, it actually left Neptune a little bit more slowly. Now that doesn't matter, it's still leaving the solar system, which Pioneer and Voyagers were destined to do, because if we look at the escape velocity from the solar system, that's indicated by the blue line. Notice that the spacecraft launch from Earth, if it didn't get a gravity assist from Jupiter, it would not have sufficient speed to leave the solar system. It would end up orbiting the Sun essentially forever. By getting a gravity assist from Jupiter, Jupiter of course is a very massive planet, and if you get it right you get a substantial gravity assist, and you can see that that put its velocity above the blue line, which meant that from now on this object is going to be leaving the solar system. A second gravity assist from Saturn and Uranus, and even a little bit of a speed drop from Neptune, doesn't bring the red line below the blue line, which means from this point onwards, this spacecraft is quite definitely going to leave the solar system. It's going to take quite a while to reach the nearest star, maybe 40,000 years or so, but it's going to get there. Using a gravity assist, like we've just been looking at, for getting from Jupiter to Saturn, Saturn to Uranus, Uranus to Neptune, because of the enormous distances in the outer solar system, it's no surprise that gravity assists have been very useful to get there on sensible timescales, to get that speed up so that A, we use less fuel, and B, we can get there faster. So a very sensible thing to do. Perhaps it's not so obvious that gravity assists are also used for the inner planets. So here's the orbits 
of Bepi Colombo. It left Earth, but one of the first things it does is fly by Earth again to slow it down. And then it flies by Venus in 2020. And then it flies by Venus a second time in 2021 to slow it down even further. It actually flew past Mercury in 2021. Its destination is Mercury. It flew past in 2021, but it's not actually going to go into orbit until 2025 or 2026. And the idea is, as well as the possibility of flying past a planet to rob it of some of its momentum and speed yourself up, it's possible to do it by effectively just deciding where you're going to pass, pass the planet, on which side, if you like. It is possible to lose speed and actually transfer some of your energy, some of your momentum to the planet rather than robbing the planet of some of its momentum. So a planetary flyby can lose speed. And you need that for going, for instance, to Mercury, because you're falling into the inner solar system. If you were just to fall into the, solar, uh, the inner solar system, you'd be moving far too fast. As you're losing gravitational energy, you would be gaining far too much speed. So you need flybys, and in the case of Bepi Colombo, you need lots of them. It's going to be doing, how many is it, six flybys of Mercury before it loses enough speed that it will be able to match the speed of Mercury and then go into orbit around it. So a flyby or a gravity assist can actually accelerate or decelerate, depending on the actual details of how you fly past the planet. But in both cases, regardless of whether you're using it to increase your velocity or decrease your velocity, in both cases, you can gain or lose without firing a rocket. You don't need to take fuel with you to have these gravity assists. You need just to make sure you're in the right place at the right time. So it's rather important that you fly your spacecraft in the right direction in the first place. So you've got to do your calculations very carefully. But if you get it right, you don't have to use much fuel. Once you arrive at your target, whatever that might be, in the case of Pioneer and Voyager, they were only flying by. They only were there for a few hours before they moved on to their next target. But some spacecraft go to a planet and then go into orbit. For instance, Cassini went into orbit around Saturn and the orbits were very complex. It didn't simply go into one orbit and stick to that orbit and photograph the planet. The orbits kept changing. And if you want to keep changing your orbit, you need to keep burning fuel. So for Cassini, you can see how complex the orbital structures were. Cassini was continually changing its orbit every few months or so over the decade or so of its mission, which means it had to carry enough fuel with it to make sure it could change its orbit periodically. It wanted to do this for two reasons. One, it wanted to visit various moons, and of course all of the moons are continuously in motion around Saturn, and so you need to keep changing your orbit to try and get as close to, as possible to this moon, or as close as possible to that moon. If you want a close flyby of Titan or Enceladus, you need to make sure your orbit is suitable to get a close encounter with those moons. Also, Cassini wanted to get detail of the Saturnian ring system from various angles, and indeed it wanted to get very close to the ring system as well as pulling out into more distant orbits. So you can see it's a rather complex structure, and that did indeed require a substantial amount of fuel over the many years it was in orbit before finally the last bit of fuel was used to crash Cassini into Saturn itself. Let's have a look at part four of this talk. What are these Lagrange points all about? So let's remind ourselves what we said originally. If you've got a couple of hypothetical objects, a green planet and a red planet, going around the sun, we said that the object closer to the sun experiences a stronger gravitational pull, so it moves faster. As a result, it goes around the sun in a much shorter period of time. The red object further from the sun, a weaker gravitational pull, and so it goes round in a longer period. So this is the classic idea of how planets move around the sun. Close to the sun, very short years. Further away from the sun, very long years. How do we change that? Or we could ask, can it be changed? 
The arrows show the gravitational pull. The red is further away from the sun, so the gravitational pull is a little bit weaker, hence the shorter arrow pulling on the red compared to the longer arrow pulling on the green. The greater the distance, the less the force. Remember, force depends on 1 over distance squared. So we can ask ourselves, is that always the case? Well, it's always the case if the objects are well separated from each other. We can't change the gravitational pull of the sun, but we can arrange it so that the red object is actually quite close to the green. In other words, let's imagine that we've got an object in the red orbit. So let's imagine that the green orbit is a planet and the red object, the red orbit, sorry, the red object is an object that we are trying to move around the sun and we're going to place it close enough to the Earth so that that object not only feels the gravitational pull of the Sun, but it feels the gravitational pull of the Earth as well. So let's assume that the green planet is Earth, and remember Earth goes around the Sun, of course, in one year. The red orbit, if it wasn't close to the Earth, the red orbit would have a period of more than a year. For instance, Mars would have a period of more than one year. But what if? What if we can arrange that red orbit not to scale in this diagram. What if we can arrange it so that red orbit is close enough that the red object feels the pull of the sun and feels the pull of the earth? So there are now two gravitational pulls on the red object. Now it can be shown, not surprisingly, we're not going to do the maths, it can be shown that if the red object is at just the right distance, the extra pull from the earth means that the red object, instead of moving around the sun in more than one year, the extra gravitational pull makes it travel faster. And so it goes around the sun in one year. In other words, it goes around the sun in the same time it takes the Earth to go around the sun. So that means as they move, they now move in lockstep. The red object is always being pulled towards the sun and the Earth, which are always in the same direction as far as it's concerned. The Earth is always in the same direction as the Sun. As seen from the Earth, the red object is always on the opposite side of the Sun. So in other words, the red object is always sitting there above midnight, above the dark side of the Earth. Let's just run that animation again. Because red is now being pulled by green and the Sun, it will go round in a year. And hence, as seen from the Earth, the red object appears to be always in the same place. It's always on the opposite side from the Sun. And that addition of the pull of the Earth and the pull of the Sun is what keeps the point L2 moving in lockstep with the Earth. So it's not stationary. It's moving the same way the Earth does. It moves around the Sun in one year, just like the Earth moves around the Sun in one year. So L2, the second Lagrange point, is always sitting there above midnight. So we've got the noon side of the Earth on this side facing the Sun. We've got the midnight side of the Earth, and L2 is hovering there above the midnight side of the Earth. Now, this is not to scale. I've kept this diagram as simple as possible. So the distance from the Earth to the Sun is one astronomical unit. And it so happens that the distance from Earth to the L2 point is about 1% of that, 0 0.01 astronomical units. So quite definitely not to scale for simplicity of the diagram. The idea is exactly the same for another Lagrange point called L1, but you can see that if L1 is inside the Earth's orbit, that means any object sitting at L1 is pulled towards the Sun in one direction and is pulled towards the Earth in the other direction. And again, you can calculate how far do you have to be from the Sun or from the Earth such that the sum of these two forces means that the object at L1 doesn't go round the Sun in less than a year, it goes round the Sun in precisely one year. And again, L1 moves in lockstep with the Earth. Again, the distance from the Earth to the Sun is 1 AU, and as it happens, the distance from L1 to the Earth is about the same as the distance from Earth to L2. It's about 1% of an astronomical unit. They're not quite identical distances, but they are very close to each other. And of course, L1 is a good place to actually put a spacecraft 
on which you want to observe the sun because the earth simply never gets in the way. If you were to put an object, a spacecraft, to observe the sun in earth orbit, then every once in a while the earth would get in the way. So by putting a spacecraft at L1, you can observe the sun unobstructed and the earth will never get between the sun and L1. How do you calculate where these Lagrange points are? Well, I've told you how it is we do it. We simply have to work out what is the gravitational pull on a hypothetical object such that the addition of the forces from the Earth and the force from the Sun add together to give you a period of one year. Newton tells us how we work out gravitational force. It just depends on the objects and the square of the distance between them. And so we can use Newton's laws to simply say, right, we just have to solve that equation where big M is the mass of the Sun, little m is the mass of the Earth, big R is how far the Sun is from the Earth, and little r is the distance we're trying to calculate, the distance from the Earth to either the L1 point or the L2 point. All we have to do is to solve for r. Simples. OK, yes, I started this by saying it's not that hard if you just skip the maths. OK, so we're not going to do the maths. We simply have to accept that Newton tells us the maths can be worked out. We're not going to do it, you'll be glad to know. But yes, we can write down the formula and we can calculate the solutions for this is where Lagrange point 1 is, this is where Lagrange point 2 is. There are other Lagrange points, 3, 4 and 5. I am not going to talk about those, but it turns out there are five places where you can park a spacecraft relative to the Earth's orbit. There are other Lagrange points for other objects moving around the Sun. So L1, I've said, is a good place to put a solar observatory. L2 is a good place to put an object which, if you have a sun shield, for instance, Gaia and the James Webb Space Telescope have sun shields, which means a sun shield can block the light from the sun and the Earth and the moon because all of these objects are always on the same side. If you were to block the light from the sun, you're automatically blocking light from Earth and Moon because they are in the same direction, because L2 goes round the Sun in the same way the Earth goes round the Sun. So a single Sun shield can block light or heat in the case of James Webb Space Telescope, which is concerned about the infrared universe, so it doesn't want any heat coming from the Sun or the Earth or the Moon. That can all be blocked with a Sun shield which is kept in one particular orientation. Now, actually, because L2 is 1% of an astronomical unit, roughly speaking, about a million miles or so away from Earth, 1 million miles away from Earth, L2 is actually in Earth's shadow, just about in Earth's shadow. And if you want to use solar cells for charging your spacecraft's power systems, well, being in the Earth's shadow is not a good idea. So Gaia and James Webb both orbit around L2 in a so-called halo orbit perpendicular to the line joining Earth and the L2 point. It's also a good idea not to be at the L2 point, not simply because of the shadow of the Earth, but also because if you think about it, if you're communicating with Earth, if you're sending or receiving radio signals along this green line from L2 to the Earth, the Sun is immediately behind the Earth. And so, because the Sun is a source of radio waves, you're going to get a lot of interference if you're trying to pick up a signal from Earth and there's a large radio Sun behind it. So, being in orbit around L2 makes a certain amount of sense. If a spacecraft drifts away from L2 in the sense of if it goes sideways in this diagram up or down, then the gravity of Earth will pull it back. In other words, if an object drifts this way, Earth pulls it back. If an object drifts this way, the Earth pulls it back. So it's a self-correcting system. It's an orbital system in which the Earth is keeping the object in orbit. However, if the, orb if the object at L2 happens to drift towards the Earth or drift away from the Earth, nothing is going to stop it drifting away. In other words, if it drifts towards the Earth, the Earth will effectively catch it. If it drifts away from the Earth, it will be lost forever. So you can't allow an object to drift too far in this direction. In the other directions, the Earth will always pull it back to L2. But in these directions, you've got to be very careful as to not allow your spacecraft to drift. 
And one of the easiest ways of seeing that is to have this rather colourful diagram, which effectively is showing you the dynamics of how things behave close to Lagrange points. This particular donut looking object is a useful way of thinking about it. If you imagine that these contours, which are effectively contours of energy, just imagine them as contours of height and think of this donut as being an object that's coming out of the page. And think about a ball that would want to roll downhill if these were contours of height. If we look a little more closely at L2, we can see what's actually going on. So let's blow up that rectangle to see it a little more clearly. So red contours are high, blue contours are low, and we're thinking about an object that wants to roll downhill. So which way is downhill? We've got Earth on the left and we've got the L2 point as that red dot. Which are the directions of downhill? Downhill, remember, means going from red to blue. That means downhill is towards the Earth or away from the Earth. But if we move away from the red dot this way, downhill brings us back again. If we go this way, downhill brings us that way again. So if an object was sitting on this particular structure, it would want to sit in that particular position, but we'd have to be very careful it doesn't roll off this one way or the other. So the shape of this particular surface, L2 is not a top of a hill as far as the energy diagram is concerned. L2 is not the bottom of a valley or the bottom of a well, because downhill is different in different directions. You can see from those arrows, it's not, they're not all pointing out and they're not all pointing Ill, in. So L2 is actually a so-called saddle point. Mathematically, we would express it like that. If we were to move away from the red dot, and again, we think of it as height, ab height above sea level, if we move this way, we're pulled back again. If we move this way, we're pulled back again. But if we go this way, we fall off the saddle. That's why it's called a saddle point. So if there's only one take home message from this particular talk, remember that Gaia and the James Webb Space Telescope are sitting at a Pringle because Pringles are basically saddles. And that is the dynamics of what's happening at the L2 point. It's only a function of gravity, but when gravity acts on a rotating system, you get these particular results. So the James Webb Space Telescope and other objects, there are going to be more uh, spacecraft going to be parked at L2 before too long. The James Webb Space Telescope can park in a so-called halo orbit, as indicated by that red ellipse there, around L2. And Earth's gravity will keep it orbiting, but we do have to be very careful not to let James Webb drift too far towards Earth, and we definitely don't want to let it drift away from Earth. There are some small th thrusters on this side, such that if it drifts towards Earth, it can be pushed a little bit further to the right to bring it back towards L2. But if it drifts too far away from Earth, then there are no thrusters on this side because we don't want anything to contaminate the mirror. We don't want anything to make the mirror warm. So the thrusters and other associated hardware are only on this side of the sun shield. So we are OK letting it drift slightly towards the Earth and then nudging it back into position. But we do not want to nudge it so far that we go beyond the L2 point and push it away from Earth. So we will need a little bit of fuel to give it a nudge every once in a while. It's been calculated that they should be happily orbiting L2 for months at a time. And every few months, perhaps every six months or so, they might just give it the slightest nudge just to keep it in the L2 position. Thanks to the amazing accuracy with which they got it there in the first place, they needed very little of the onboard fuel to actually get it to L2 which means they have not just five years of fuel left for station keeping, they have probably 10, 15, even 20 years of station keeping fuel left. So hopefully that will extend the lifetime of objects like the James Webb Space Telescope. As well as Lagrange points being really weird, there are some orbits that are really weird. For instance, not circles and ellipses, but as seen from the rotating frame of Earth going around the Sun, there are some orbits that look like horseshoes, which sounds ridiculous, but you have to remember 
that if you think about how these objects are moving, as indicated by the arrows, they're actually obeying the rules that we've already laid out. When closer to the sun, the object is going faster than the Earth, because it's closer to the sun than the Earth. And so if the Earth is going around in an orbit which is anti-clockwise, then the object on this red line will catch up with the Earth. But if it's further away from the Sun than the Earth on the other side, when it's further from the Sun, it's going to be pulled less by the Sun, it's going to be travelling slower. So if the Earth is going round the Sun in an anti-clockwise fashion, then any object further from the Sun than the Earth will appear to go backwards, and hence it'll follow the arrows on the outside part of this large horseshoe. When it gets close to the Earth, the Earth gives it a nudge and sends it on the other side. When it gets close to the Earth, the Earth pulls it a little bit and it ends up on the other side. So yes, it's a perfectly allowable orbit that follows all of the rules we've been looking at up till now. And it's only following the rules of gravitational pull depends on the mass and the inverse distance squared. And when you work out the mechanics, it so happens that objects can follow these rather odd looking contours on this energy donut. Indeed, some objects have been found around planetary systems and some moons have been found that do actually follow these really weird horseshoe orbits. They are not just theoretical oddities. Some objects do actually move like this. Perhaps the weirdest, weirdest orbits of all are those that actually are not closed loops at all. We tend to think of orbits as being circles or ellipses or possibly even weird things like horseshoes. But it is possible for some objects to follow the laws of gravity, but not actually in closed loops. For instance, here's a rather specific example. What if we were to take three objects, red, green and blue, and position them as indicated by their current positions, and with no velocity, just position them there and then let them go and let gravity pull? What would they do? Well, the red object would be attracted towards the blue and the green, so the red object would presumably move towards the right and up a bit. The green object, being pulled by the other two, will move to the left and perhaps a little bit up as well. The blue object is going to be pulled towards the red and the green, so presumably the blue object is going to move down. But what paths do they follow? The result is very, very counterintuitive. These three objects would follow these curves. And then they would be pulling on each other and they would stop and then they would fall back along exactly the same paths. So none of these paths are anything close to conic sections. They're not circles, ellipses, parabola, hyperbole. They are open, not closed loops. And they are really weird. Is it possible for, a, for instance, a triple star system to ever move in this way? Well, it's a mathematical oddity, but you could never expect a physical system to actually adopt this particular set of non-closed loops, because you would never be able to start with three stars positioned at certain points in space with no velocity at exactly the right place, and then let them go to follow these particular paths. Stars form, remember, because of collapsing clouds which have a certain rotation, a certain amount of angular momentum, and planets around stars again are born with circular or at least some rotational motion, making the planets spin and making the planets rotate around their parent star. So although it's mathematically possible for three objects to obey the laws of gravitation and end up in these rather weird loops, we know of no way that it can actually happen in practice. And don't get me started on black holes. When we think about objects moving around black holes, the space and time around a black hole are so warped by the gravity of the black hole that a gravity, that a orbit does not obey the gravity rules of Newton and it doesn't obey any of Kepler's laws. So Kepler's laws and Newton's laws have to go out of the window when we're dealing with space and time which are so incredibly warped in the vicinity of the, gravi the extreme gravity of a black hole. 
So why is rocket science considered to be so hard? Well, as I intimated in the very first slide, it's because the maths gets in the way. Rocket science, if you want to do it properly, is a very mathematical thing. But the underlying principles are simple enough. Well, yes, there are some objects in the solar system that move in ways that are not, at first sight, intuitive. You might expect circles and ellipses, so it might come as a bit of a shock to realise that some objects appear to move in horseshoe orbits. And yes, absolutely, calculating how to put the James Webb Space Telescope into orbit around L2 was not a trivial task, especially when you consider the phenomenal accuracy that they actually achieved at the end, saving so much fuel. The details, the maths, is complex, but the underlying ideas are straightforward enough. Stronger gravitational pull leads to faster motion. We can just think of the Earth going around the Sun faster than Mars goes around the Sun because it's closer to the Sun and experiences a larger gravitational pull. Everything else is just detail. That's really all there is to orbital mechanics. The rest is just maths. After all, it's not rocket science. Thank you for listening.